Here's a question that we probably should have asked up top. Did okay. you enjoy it? Did you think it was funny? Um, I will say this. I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought because the way it was preemptively framed, and I don't know if this is your take on it, I expected it to be like, people were making it sound like it was in the net and it had like no jokes and it was just going to be him ranting. And I mean, there was a decent amount of jokes in there. You know, when, Whether they were in good taste or not is, you know, up to you. But one thing I found interesting from looking at all the preemptive framing was the only thing people were litigating was whether or not he was homophobic or transphobic. But I saw, despite some things that might be legitimately argued to be homophobic or transphobic, a lot of probing questions about uh, white LGBTQ racism at several points that people either just ignored or kind of minimized to get back to litigating whether he was homophobic or transphobic. So I feel like the discourse that happened after this and reading the characterizations of it before I actually saw it kind of um, proved one of his points that people kind of care more about in this current mainstream discourse, the um, homophobic or transphobic issue than the racism issue. And something else that I, um, like one thing I want to clarify, uh, and I hate to like respond to Dr. Thrasher after he's gone because then it doesn't give him a chance to um, clarify or whatever, but it's just he had to go. I, had no, I have no choice. But um, he responded to my point about um, that I think people are erasing the uh, intersectionality in the word black by thinking that he can't be talking about black gay and black trans people. In, you know, uh, he took that to mean that I was saying that I think black gay and trans people are doing that and that they don't care about other black people. But I was talking more about the mainstream discourse and the um, white gay white allies. or yeah. 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 The white allies. And I wasn't talking about the black trans people. And I think one of the things that kind of gets lost in examining this is that in Dave Chappelle's own words, he seems to think that this is a body of work that has to be taken together. And at one point he even references the lines from the other three works to kind of show that he's been building toward, you know, um, this, which is the finale. Like, you know, you have to take it all together to get the context. And part of the reason why I think it's, um, one shouldn't be so quick to dismiss the idea that he's including uh, black gay and black trans people when he's talking about blackness is in one of the previous specials, he makes a point. And again, this is one of those points where whether you agree with it or disagree with it, I saw very few people in the mainstream discourse willing to engage in it in good faith where he was saying, um, if it was only non-white people or women who wanted to be um, trans, but white men didn't, and particularly white privileged men, didn't want to be trans as well, people kind of wouldn't care. It wouldn't be getting all this traction. And in a way, that's a very intersectional point because he's trying to say that the whiteness and the maleness and the privilege, you know, works together with being trans to get a kind of different result in the society, you know, that people will take it more seriously and will get a lot more rights. But if uh, white, powerful, um, you know, bourgeois people weren't interested in this as well, mainstream society would probably, you know, consider it mostly like a quirk or still something something weird and i thought that was a very intersectional uh point and maybe it's not one that kimberly crenshaw would make but in the broad idea of intersectionality i think it counts but um to me that evidence is that he thinks the blackness of the black gay and trans people plays such a role that it lumps them in with the rest of black people like, like he's saying in that in that joke whether you agree with that joke or not he's saying that he thinks of the black gay and trans people on the side of the marginalization issue as him, as a black person, you know, as opposed yeah. to, so, so yeah, that, that's why I think it's, you can't just quickly dismiss that he does not think of black, gay, and trans people when he brings up uh, the minimization of, of blackness, because he's right, explicitly well, mentioned that in the past. Well, what I thought was interesting was that there, there was a thread of kind of class analysis throughout this that I did not expect from him. So Agreed. a lot of people were quoting his opening line about how, hey, I'm rich and famous, as like him being just a jerk. But his, the, what he was actually saying was, I'm rich and famous, so I haven't experienced COVID the way that I've, most normal people have, and I hope you guys are doing okay. 
Like when, when I started watching the special after having all of the presumptions that I had based to your point on how it had been framed, I had very, I had very negative, ne- the negative views going into it. I didn't enjoy the last special. I, I, I found it to be difficult to watch and had to like start and stop a couple of times. I, was I expecting. I, I, I confess that I'm not a long-term Chappelle fan when people were really hype about it in college and like we're watching it in like common spaces on campus. I was very uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable with all these white mixed race Harvard kids yoking it up and like being one of the only few black people in the space. And like most of the black people also seem to not have any problem with it, I will say. But I remember being uncomfortable about it from the get go. So I've never been some big fan. But I, from the get-go watching the special, it became very clear that the, there was a significant gap between how it had been represented versus what it was. That's not to absolve it of being problematic. Exactly. Um, it, it is but, still problematic. But the fact of the gap, to me, it's like, well, let's just have a good faith conversation about it because otherwise you're proving his point in these ways. And let's just not feed that beast if we disagree with the arguments that he's making. That was the feeling I had. Like There were so many good faith uh, lines of attack that could be made on right. this special because I think there are genuinely problematic parts right. that it was kind of bothering me that people were bringing up like you know uh, someone was made a think piece uh, I think it was Akilah Hughes saying that uh, chads are going to go out there and start killing trans people because it is special and it's like okay I, you know it's a bit I, I, you know like why do you have to go there there's so much on paper that we can talk about that was actually said like this and then yeah. You know, I mean, I agree with a lot of things that you say, but uh, to add one more thing about the um, why I say it's about the white allies and the uh, mm-hmm. uh, white mainstream mm-hmm. game movement and not me disparaging black, gay and trans people. When I say what I said is if you look at the people who are pushing the black trans narrative, you know, of a black trans epidemic, like the hardest, you know, it'll be like uh, HRC, that organization and one of the things I noticed, they always have like a yearly report and it shows all like the trans people that died. And they've started like really, once like this thing about how a disproportionate amount of them are like black and poor happened, they started doing all this stuff on their site where they talk about, you know, black trans epidemic, how hard they have it, intersectionality and stuff like that. And they're kind of using the black trans people as a way to kind of uh, engender a lot of sympathy for their cause and to fundraise off of it. And all this stuff. So I'm like, okay, that's good. But when you look at the site, and I've been looking at the site for like years now, and I look at the part that says our work, and whenever you go to the site, it's stuff like getting um, gay and trans people in college and professional sports, electoral stuff, mm-hmm. bills. You look at the bills, and none of it has to do with poor black trans people. Yeah, yeah, homelessness. Uh, a lot of, yeah. uh, and if you think I'm lying, you can go to. Access. Yeah, you can go to their website and see everything that they that they do. You know, they, they, uh, talking about trying to push the Equality Act, and most of the stuff in the Equality Act is uh, none of it is really about something that will help uh, Black trans people because the Black trans people are dying in places where just Black people are dying. You know, you know what and, I mean. And, so and it's poor people. You know, and poor. I mean, yeah, there yeah, is that poor, poor yeah, Black people. Yeah. So yeah. What, so so I just to finish this real quick. I feel there's something kind of disingenuous about using black trans people as a way to make the trans plight look extra uh, bad because you don't want to just have a movement that's about bourgeois concerns with uh, marriage acts and 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 all this stuff i get that but then i want to see you do a lot of stuff for these people you're using to you know and i just don't feel and this feels kind of disingenuous because much like you know bernie people like to point out that if you raise the conditions of all poor people, black people will be helped too. If you raise, the best thing you can do to help poor black trans people to me is to make the life of poor black people in general less of a living hell, you know? Or even if you sincerely just focused on making the lives of poor black trans people not a living hell, it would inert to the benefit of poor black people. I mean, like, yeah, they, either they, yeah, way, You're right. but it, it does seem to be like the poor part and the black part are not addressed because I think even if you when I take the cynicism out of it, those require structural changes that are a lot harder than for all that it's relevant and important, like a marriage bill is, right? Agreed. Like there's on a certain level, on a certain really basic level, City Citibank, you, you know, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, their bottom line is not affected by whether or not gay people can get married. It just isn't. 
the same way that having housing as a human right or people being able to leave their jobs because they're not worried about health care insecurity um, are going to affect the duopoly, like the, the corporate status quo. But I do want to come back to this to this uh, class point and be specific about it. So he opens with this rich and famous, I'm rich and famous, okay, which people misinterpreted. And then he goes on to uh, make several other jokes that have as their theme, when people get into position of power, they act like assholes, regardless of who they are, <laughs> right? Regardless yeah. of their previous uh, persecuted status. So, and some people were mad about these jokes too. There was a joke about how the, the black former slave gets a bit of land and by, owns slaves, gets black slaves. There's a joke about um, the space Jews joke <laughs> yeah, um, where he basically tells a story of like what if aliens were really originally from earth and then they leave and they come back and they're like, this is ours. We're going to do it with it what we want. Um, and he says, we're going to name the story space Jews. And that's a callback to a story he told earlier that basically made the same implications about how that's what's going on in Israel. You can say what you want about the substance of the joke, but with, when that is such a steady theme throughout, it does start to feel like he's, he is saying something that I think is not entirely dismissible about us confusing rhetoric for power. I mean, it shouldn't be entirely dismissible, but I think in practice, we're finding out it's surprisingly <laughs> dismissible, the, the way people are just not talking about it. So yeah, right. I agree. It should maybe it's his fault. Like maybe if, yeah, he does, maybe if he wants people to take him seriously, then he shouldn't like talk about, you know, meaty dicks at the urinal or whatever he wants to say. Like Very that's fair. on him. Yeah. And there's a lot of unnecessary poking of the bear yeah. that he's knowingly doing. Like he's, he's clearly a troll. And I think it, Correct. works against him a lot of the time like he's clearly getting off on saying certain things you know at the most poignant part you know he will like you know throw in something really trolly yeah yeah so but i thought that was a great point the one where he said even the white people even the white slave owners were like yo you gotta chill like i think that still happens today where i feel like sometimes like these larry elder types sometimes say stuff where you see even the white people have to like pull back <laughs> or like with candace owens uh, Turning Point USA had to just be like, okay, chill. Like, uh, we didn't want you to go that far. You're here to be a shield, but uh, this shield has holes in it. We're gonna get, uh, we're gonna catch some strays. You have to go. So yeah, I, I uh, totally agree with everything that that you said. And it's funny because in this discourse now, if you're not all the way on one side, then people assume you're all the way on the other. So I've been fielding a lot of comments and things where people think I'm just uncritically championing uh dave Chappelle and just giving a rubber stamp to every joke that uh he said and it's not like that it's not like that at all i totally think there is a lot of room for improvement and i think he ended on the type of note that he should have threaded the special with more where he said i'm not gonna do these jokes anymore unless i'm 100 percent sure that we're laughing together you know right and, and like that's a great sentiment but like yeah. you did this whole special and said that at the exactly. end and many of the things that you said in the special obviously don't have people from the targeted communities laughing with you so it, it, it just it, seems exactly. really empty it sounds nice but in practice it uh, did you really live up to it it's it's, it's not a, it's almost like a get out of jail free card you know right. like i appreciated the sentiment but i think it would have been better threaded that sentiment threaded throughout the uh, special a little bit more but i think there's like a little vengeful side to the special as well yes. like i think the hypocrisy has been kind of getting him upset and i think that run of and you've you've uh touched on this during this interview and i totally agree with you that there seems to be a little bit of that residual bitterness of yeah. the legacy of his old show and mm -hmm. what he feels like um the disservice he kind of did. Like, I think he feels kind of hoodwinked by privileged whites, like that he thought they were laughing with him and they were really laughing at him. And he's, I think there's a part of wanting to give people a taste of their own medicine. But I think a big thing that's missing from all these specials, I think would help a lot is he doesn't really go after like the person that you're talking about in the Harvard dorm that mm -hmm. was laughing and making you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, a lot of these, um, white gay and white trans people are white and behave in a lot of the hypocritical ways that white people do but i've yet to see you say something that's going to get like the anti-woke white reactionary male crowd really mad like you know and that's the, who i feel 
were the biggest culprits of using shows like the Chappelle show, the boondocks, boondocks. or all these things as a oh, license. People love to watch the boondocks in the common spaces. I'm like, why are you yeah, doing this? Let's just watch this in private. <laughs> yeah, but they, they like using a black medium to um, do the type of minstrelsy that they can't get away with, you know, from, from a white person. And yeah. I, I wish in his specials he had some more smoke for them. And I think it would balance things out a lot more. I think I, I agree with a lot of his points about white, gay and trans racism. And I disagree with some of them, but the one thing I do think is regardless of what proportion I agree or disagree, there's a disproportionate amount of time spent on them. When I think the biggest culprits were, you know, the, the cis straight white men bros who just really got off on thinking they had a pass to say uh, the N word, the same people who love the old Chris Rock uh, niggas versus black people joke, mm-hmm. you know, that type of person. And I, I, I hope if he comes back to stand up comedy, he does a special that's as scorching to them as he's done to some you know other groups. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it does. You, you can't ignore. Like, I, I was surprised when I heard the joke about like, oh, I had to I had to punch this lesbian woman. And there's con. I mean, I'm not saying it's excusable context, but it's. It makes yeah. more sense in context than what I just said. Um, and I'm I hoping was, it's exaggerated. I want to look it up. I only just saw it before we recorded, so yeah. I didn't have a chance to get the context, but yeah. I mean, the the the, the bit is that he was at a club or some place, and he made small talk with some woman there. And it turns out, you know, she was a partner of this lesbian woman who kind of stepped to him and was like, stop talking to my girl and was looking for a fight. And he didn't realize a woman which is hilarious to dave Chappelle, lol <laughs> and um you know she, when he did he changed his tone of voice and took a step back and was like okay we're obviously not gonna fight but she persisted in getting aggressive with him and she he, he like changed his voice and like said to her i think he said as a pimp would say <laughs> yeah. you know step back you better watch yourself but here's the thing like no one's mad about the about him making fun of the idea that like pimps abuse sex workers. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like nobody's mad about that. Nobody's mad about the, you know, the priest molestation joke. Like it, you can't ignore it. the 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 the, the, the the hypocrisy, like the the differential anger metrics here are difficult to ignore. And that's to say like everyone should be mad at everything. Like that's fine. <laughs> I mean, people still laugh at, uh, is Wayne Brady going to have to smack a bitch from the first uh, series, you know, when Wayne yeah. Brady was dressed as a pimp and the humor was that yeah. he's going to smack his hose. Yes. He says, bitch, 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 all the way throughout. And I was reflecting on, like, am I offended when he's, like, referring to him as bitches? And, like, if I'm not, is this internalized misogyny? Is this my problem? Like, is it different than when he says the N-word, which I also don't care about? Yeah. I... I, I I, I don't know how to answer that. Like, if you ask me, do I think that when he says, like, on some level, we live in a misogynist society. So the fact that we like there's like an edge and like a funniness to using the word bitch wouldn't it wouldn't exist if we didn't live in a society that was like misogynist. Like if the word had like no power or no edge, he wouldn't be using it. But do I think that it is literally a manifestation of like misogyny in any meaningful way not exactly i think he's just being an edgelord yeah yeah and a particular type of edgelord like he's a gen x edgelord yes. you know I, I i feel like gen x and elder millennials a lot of them and it's funny i think a lot of those gen x edgelords have kind of woken up to like okay this is just not funny anymore so now sarah silverman's talking about jew face when she used to be one of those you know female chauvinist pigs like i'm gonna out f- frat bro the the bros, you know, and people like Amy Schumer, um, you know, Chelsea Handler, like they've all kind of realized, hey, that time of, you know, trying to be more of a um, white asshole bro than the actual bros, that thing is dead. But I think Chappelle's richness and his um, social bubbles have kept him way too stuck in that yeah. Gen X specific edgelord type. Of, I mean, he spends all his time hanging out with like Joe Rogan and... And old Bilber. rappers, and you know, at the end of the show, they show the people, yeah. him and his celebrity friends, and it's like, okay, there's not like a millennial in this, really. It's like maybe Chance the Rapper, as but yeah, I'm like, 
yeah, he's doing a podcast with Talib Kweli. Like he is, yeah. you know, because 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 I'm Gen X and I always think, but uh, and I'm an elder millennial. <laughs> yeah, but I think like uh, you and I, based on uh, what we've had to do, uh, have been exposed to a lot of different viewpoints and age groups, and you know, I'm sure you've had to do a lot of. Uh, you know, Gen Z outreach and everything. Yeah, and I've I had just, to grow. Like, yeah. I have been confronted with the fact that I, my beliefs are retrograde. Like, my my previous beliefs are retrograde. You know, we just recorded yeah. an episode with my best friend from college who didn't come out until I graduated law school, so like four years after college. Because that was the world we lived in. Do you know what I mean? That's not an excuse, but like, I sometimes I feel like there's an unwillingness to even acknowledge that the pace of change is gonna, it, it like causes dissonance. And as someone who has felt dissonance, like, I feel like even acknowledging that I have felt dissonance means that I am, like, marked, you know, with the mark of cane or something, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. But, like, it's so human. And that's part of why I have empathy when I go into other spaces, like, that affect me. When people are like, why are you so, like, willing to talk to racists and stuff like this? It's like, well, there's a racist racist and there's someone who just, like, uses the wrong lingo and isn't up to facts and, like... I, I'm sensitive I mean, to I mean, it. There have been words that five years ago I didn't know were uh, slurs, and people told me, you know, online, you know, in the old tweets yeah. and stuff, and I didn't, I didn't know. But it's like the things if that I were wasn't said on college, Twitter. <laughs> was it the, the the things that people said yeah. as mm-hmm. a matter of like like nobody like these Gen Zers need to under like Gen Xers Gen Z Gen Zers, and this is not an excuse, but like the reality of the world is that like. Gay jokes were completely above board like 10 years ago, like not that long ago. Like no hesitation in movies and books. Go back and watch Gilmore Girls and it's not pretty. <laughs> Even like a woke show like that, you know? Remember John? Remember John Stewart? He was like a, 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 a woke, a proto woke paragon. Yes. And he had the Chief Justice Chick with Dick's uh, Daily Show joke. <laughs> I don't remember that. And I oh, don't, it, I don't want to remember they it. They brought it back when he was doing the rounds a, a year or two ago to promote something. Uh, yeah, yeah. He uh, he was making fun of Dennis Kucinich. And I'll give Dennis Kucinich, Dennis Kucinich is a rare example because he, I think he's older than Gen X and that dude was way ahead of the curve. Yeah, he was talking sure. about Big trans rights energy. and, you know, having a trans Supreme Court justice in like the 2000s. I think, I think that's what it was. And mm. John Stewart was mocking him about how ridiculous it was and goes, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, Chief Justice Chicks with Dicks? And the crowd loved it. This is the crowd of NPR tote bag loving, uh, you know, latte sipping liberals and yeah. they're just, the joke killed, you know? And, yeah. It wasn't that long ago. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, what do you think about this question of if there are some genuinely objectionable parts? Like, I don't think there's any getting around the absurdity and the offensiveness of gender as a fact and that whole part of the the special. Like, it's just absurd. Yeah. Um, and it is turfy. Um, like, definitionally. And, and what do you think about this argument that, you know, if there is something that is transphobic and, and turf ish turf i don't know what the adjective how do you describe it, it is makes him a turf it's turf lingo in the show that it's all or nothing because this is the conversation that comes up with you know musical artists and do you still watch the cosby show and all of these other kind of contexts and i feel like it's just this unresolved thing that is affecting part of this debate where obviously some people enjoyed the special for its humor value even even if they would agree with the critiques from the LGBT community. Yeah, I mean, in general, I think he was kind of overstepping his uh, range because to me, if you only just learn what turf means, right. and, it's you, just and so you claim stupid, to... Man. <laughs> yeah, 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 if you only just learn what turf is and you've only just uh, learned the proper definition of uh, feminism, then... <laughs> I'm very sure you have not even cracked open Judith Butler. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. I mean, you're way, way out of your um, depth. depth. And he has a kind yeah. of audience that, I mean, look at the audience. And there's not a ton of young people there. It's, you know, um, again, Gen Xers and elder millennials who remember the, the old show fondly. So there's not really anybody there that's going to, um, you know, pull his coat and tell him anything. And then the people who I think are there from those groups are kind of there with a preconceived notion that we're going to heckle him. So they're not actually kind of helping him either. They're kind of making him dig in his um, heels. So yeah, I mean, 
I don't know how to get him out of his bubble. You know, I, I don't think it's going to be easy. He's going to have to actively try to step out of it. And it seemed like he was doing that to a degree with that comic that he was um, talking Daphne, about. But yeah. 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 But even then, uh, like we said before, he's too hamstrung by his need to undercut any moment of sincerity, you know, with um, a joke. And I, I, I kind of get it. You don't want like the net too, where it's going to be humorless and just a one person um storytelling show but i think there were some moments where he needed to just be earnest and i think it would have done a lot like what did you make of that anecdote he told where he was at a bar someplace rural i forget where maybe it was in ohio where he's from yeah and uh a woman at the bar they were having kind of a nice chat she seemed like a sweet lady and she said do you want to see a picture of my daughter and he's like Ugh, i mean no one wants to look at anybody's kids but fine and she showed her daughter and he smiled and said she's beautiful and then she acted this is his telling obviously like kind of offended and was like you know she's trans you know and he was like okay yeah, yeah she was trying to trap him basically Right. I mean, again, this is his framing and his telling, and maybe he's, of like, course. projecting everything onto this woman. But that, to me, was, like, really psychologically revealing. That he, in some ways, like, he, he it, it seemed like he was saying, I played the game. I said yeah. the right thing to this woman. You know, she showed me her trans daughter, and I, I'm obviously not transphobic because I, I said, like, I gave her a compliment and I moved on. And but, but I somehow he, he also added what his real it. thoughts would have been, which is that she's uh, unattractive, right? He, right? Can't, he cannot help himself. Exactly, exactly. And I don't know, like, I don't know what to, I don't know what to do with that. Me, me neither. And I felt kind of funny too because, because there were so many like bad faith um, lines of arguments. I felt like being leveled at him that. I kind of felt like I had to front load, you know, my responses to that. But after seeing the special, it really wowed me how many things he opened himself up to as far as legitimate critique that I just have seen nobody yeah. talk about. Because I think well, everybody's really circulating and using the same clips and, and yeah. they don't want to give the show of you. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I mean, pirate the show if you have to. Like, get, get a torrent so you don't give him the... <laughs> but I think people should watch the whole show. And I think we, it would open the door to a much better conversation because I suspect a lot of people who are not talking about it have simply just not seen it because it's not one of the clips that yeah, it's, it's everybody's very circulating. different. I'm not saying, again, it's not better. It's just different. And but yeah. the point I wanted to make about that, T, was like the, the other thing I said, the black slave, the Jews in space, the other one was the woman who has to pay alimony. That was the third one I couldn't Oh, yeah, of. that was a good one. And, and this is interesting because that one I think we can all talk about I kind of think more neutrally because it's not a historically, I mean, women, but like, it's not one of these more recently historically marginalized groups. And people don't come for me for that, by the way. I understand that women, like, I understand the Equal Rights Act. Like, I understand, like, please don't come for me over that. But the point is, he was talking about a woman who, because she made more money, was forced to play alimony and joking about how she sounds just like men do, you know, complaining about, uh, you know, bitches using all my money for vacation or whatever. Like, I don't remember. I'm not a comedian. And it's interesting to me because it's, again, this, like, what he's focusing down on, what's the threat that's going through all of these is, like, I'm willing to say the socially acceptable thing. I'm willing to, I, I know I shouldn't hit woman, women, right, with the lesbian fight example. Like, I know I'm, you know, I don't, I'm not supposed to be transphobic. I know I should use the right pronouns, and I do. But then sometimes people act in a way that it, this is in his like telling, I think what's going on with him psychologically, that doesn't, where they demonstrate they haven't earned my grace. Yeah. So this woman with her kid, like, I was nice to you and you still acted like a, a, a B. So this like justifies on some level my homophobic, my transphobic thought. Or like, I know it's not supposed to hit women, but like, give me an excuse and I'm going to do it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, or like, you can't be mad at men for complaining about alimony because, look, the second you are in this situation, you're going to do the same thing. Or black people and the slaves or the Jews and the Palestinians and the space people and all of the things. I felt very weirded out at the beating up a lesbian joke. And I kept thinking he was going to undercut it somehow in a good way. Like, you know, saying like she beat him up or something. 
Yeah. But then when the end of the joke was, yeah, I just, you know, gave her a two piece and a biscuit and that was it. I was like, okay, that's, yeah. I hope you're exaggerating. But even if you're not, even, even if you are exaggerating, if that's not clear, you're still kind of making people laugh at a dangerous image. And I just found it weird like, that there weren't more people saying stuff like he's going to legitimize men beating up women if, um, you know, they look masculine enough, you know, and. Yeah, that was strangely one that people did not really um, jump on. But uh, also the story that you're talking about with the bar, mm -hmm. like like all the stories I thought had um, interesting nuggets to them. But first, they were kind of too scrunched together without room to breathe because mm -hmm. I feel like you had to get all the trans stuff in there. So I think that's you had to get all the trans stuff in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Gun so I think that's head. something that made those kind of jokes. Uh, feel incomplete um i don't want to put words in your mouth but I, f I feel like that's how i felt at least about those i'm not sure if that's mm -hmm. the right word for how you felt but i felt there was something there was a germ of something but um for better or worse it it was kind of truncated and yeah like what really is he saying like i get the yeah dissonance. exactly like he he is He's identifying points, I think, of legitimate cultural dissonance or people are working stuff out and working out feelings like that even if I think aren't, let's say, legitimate or good, are very are widely shared and worth discussing. But the conclusions that he draws yes. are not informative. They don't push people in one way or the, the other, or maybe they push people in the wrong way, or they're not they're not thoughtful. The yeah, setup yeah. is very clever often. And I like I laughed along for much of the lesbian joke until it ended in the I beat up the woman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. It, its conclusions are very problematic and they might even work better if they left them as open-ended questions cuz there's some um humorists who do cultural commentary who kind of do that where the joke the, or the punchline is the open question where it's like um you kind of have to stop and go, hmm, you know, and um, that's what you're left to uh, work with. But I feel like, in general, he wants to lead people to a conclusion or a teachable moment, and he's not always qualified to um, either make the right point or make the right point in the most convincing way. So sometimes either the point is wrong or the point, you can see the rightness of it, but he phrases it in a way that is hard to co-sign. Like, there's some punchlines in there that I think make a good point, but they're full of, like, uh, you know, bitch and N-word and, and, and bad trans imagery. And it's like, I can't even Oof. use this joke and the example of the good thread in it because you've just kind of salted the earth of the joke, you know, with... Yeah, he, look, he obviously thinks that trans people are absurd. Like, he, he thinks that something about it is absurd, right? Yeah, like, that's, that's clear fair. from the way that his focus on, like, you know, the, the visual images that he paints, you know, the idea in, of, a, of, a, of a trans man having a squat over a urinal trough. Yeah. Right, to use the men's bathroom. Like, the, he, he is, like, re he's, like, delighting in the absurdity of it. Yeah, and I think he thinks that being a trans ally is to still think they're absurd, but I'm giving them space to be absurd, and I'll even entertain them to a certain degree, right. which is still, at the end of the day, kind of uh, still insulting. It's you know like tolerance I mean? as opposed to acceptance or whatever that kind of model. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and this is with Dr. Thrasher's point, which I think was well made, that it doesn't have to be either or, and that's what Dave Chappelle sets up. Like, yeah. But what he's really saying when he makes it an either or is, I'm going to go this far, but no farther. Like, I'm going to not be the literal definition of a zealous bigot because I will support your fundamental rights, but don't ask yeah. me to say it's okay. And look, he's a grown man. Like, it's a free country. He doesn't have to think it's okay. But also a lot of people don't have to want to consume his comedy, go to his shows and pay him totally. money also. so Totally. And that's something that, you know, I was telling people who thought I was trying to defend him wholesale where I was like, uh, no, I totally support people's right to not like his jokes or not like him but my only thing is i just don't like a lot of what i feel like these bad faith arguments to do that when there's so many good faith lines of attack but and also i felt 
weird about how people were very much dismissing the um, racism question and the question of, um, I mean, for all the people who were accusing him of ignoring intersectional analysis, I felt like a lot of people were ignoring a lot of his intersectional um, analysis of, you know, how race, class level, wealth level can intersect with, um, you know, uh, homosexuality or being trans to make it, I think he's trying to say like, it's not always punching, punching down mm. um, because it's more complicated than just saying uh, cis trumps um, gay or whatever. Like, you know, there's different factors and I would have loved to seen that engage more in good faith, mm. you know, as opposed to something that he just brushed aside so he can get to, um, whether or not he's transphobic or, or homophobic. Like, I kind of give up on the idea of a good faith, a totally good faith discussion happening of this special, but I also hey, we just had don't one, fully buddy. absolve him of <laughs> being part of the reason why it won't happen. He's He did a lot to guarantee there would be no good faith discussion yeah, of his better sure. points. Well, if you're listening and you know David Chappelle, feel free to let him know that we can have a good faith conversation about all of this right here on Bad Faith Podcast. And also, I think, you know, it's obviously the case that it would be beneficial to have some trans cultural critics in the room as part of this conversation. So if you're listening and have any recommendations of folks who could come on and have that conversation, I think that would be great as well. When the when the whole Chappelle special plus the Dolezal special came out at the same time, I don't even know if I want to like put out in the, that this is out in the world, but a kind of pre super fame contrapoints and I had a conversation about it and tried to get to the bottom of this question of like tra- you know transracialism versus you know transgender identity, and we were both stumbling through right me because i'm not yeah. trans and she's because she's not black and there was a certain kind of equality and how b- vulnerable we both were having this conversation that i think made it very useful so i would love to have some version of that conversation which i think is in the in the cracks between the conversation we just had and um, it was very interesting that conversation was about to explode in the mainstream discourse and a lot of people don't remember this but what uh adolf reed that did a really provocative um, uh, poking the bear piece about trying to compare transracialism to transgenderism and whatever. And regardless of whether one thinks it was right or wrong, I think it was set up to be an opening salvo in a very contentious debate that I was so interested in seeing how it shook out. But then at that exact moment, I remember like right when it was starting to crescendo, the Rachel Dolezal thing, that's when the Black Lives Matter um, media cycles started in earnest and it kind of got lost mm. and never picked up again. So I think it's very ripe to be picked up again by by you guys. I would love to watch it if you guys... Yeah. If you well, guys... I'm not necessarily volunteering. For that. Okay. Well, <laughs> I thought you are volunteering. Maybe it's a premium episode. Maybe it's, maybe it's good premium content. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to volunteer you because I wanted to see it, but I understand why you wouldn't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole. Yeah, we'll see. I didn't even necessarily want to flag that it's out there in the world. I think Conjure took it down. I don't know. We'll see. I'm going to like furiously text her after this. And be like, if it's not down, scrub it, scrub it. Um, anyway, thank you so much for spending all this time with me, Trevor, and being for being willing to submit yourself to these kind of uh, nuanced conversations, the difficult ones. Can you tell our listeners where to find you in your excellent, genuinely excellent, I listen to it all the time, podcast? Thank you. Thank you so much. And guys, pressure Brie to come on. I'm trying to get her to come on to talk about. <laughs> of course stuff. I'm going to come on. I'm like, I'm like 24 <laughs> episodes now into this horrible season of in treatment because of you. I, I have to come on because this cannot all be for naught. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's a good that's a good point. It, you're, it's the sun. It's the sun cost. It's the trap sun now. cost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, find me on Champagne Sharks anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can, We have a streaming channel that we haven't been doing recently but we're going to start up but yeah uh go to patreon.com forward slash champagne sharks or just go to champagne sharks.com all the links are there sorry if i spent a little too much time looking to the side but i have a second screen like with notes because i have a really bad memory so that's that's what i've been doing there but yeah <laughs> always happy to come on uh and i think you did a very good job at being very fair and playing devil's advocate i think this is probably the best uh, and I'm not saying this just because I was part of it. I'm saying this because of your <laughs> contribution and Dr. Thrasher's contribution. But I think this is one of the best 
good faith attempts at uh, discussing this special, if not the only one that I found. Well, I appreciate that. T, we're going to have to like clip that and put that on the internet so people know to watch. Um, and to all of our listeners, a reminder that this is a podcast, which we puts out one free episode on Thursdays and one premium episodes on Mondays every week. I rarely implore you to consider subscribing, mostly because I forget um, and I'm a bad capitalist, but you should definitely consider it so we can continue to do this kind of work and some of the substantive interviews we've been doing. I want to flag that we have some really big names coming up, including Andrew Yang, Giannis Varoufakis, um, Ro Khanna, and I'm depending on the, where the schedule falls, some of those are going to be premium and some of those are going to be public. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss all of that. Plus, you can watch full video episodes of podcasts like this one um, when you subscribe. Obviously, the free ones are full video on Twitter, uh, sorry, on YouTube regardless. You, you know, just Google Bad Faith YouTube. You can find them there. But the full premium video episodes are also available at patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month. Thank you. And as always, keep the faith. Hey, YouTube, don't forget this is a podcast. To get full episodes, including ones that are behind a paywall, go to patreon.com slash podcast To get more episodes, please do subscribe to this channel, hit the notification bell, and like this video.